Okay, well here we are, another lesson in uh, the book of Leviticus, Leviticus for Beginners. The uh, subtitle is Training for Holiness. This is lesson number eight and the title of this lesson is A Consecrated Priesthood and it'll be part one. There's, there's a lot of material in this uh, section, so we'll have to kind of break it up into a couple of parts. We'll be covering uh, Leviticus chapter eight, verse one to chapter nine, verse 24. So if you want to take out your Bibles to that uh, particular uh, uh, part of Leviticus, otherwise I'll, I'll, I'll be, any, any uh, passages, I'll be showing them uh, on the slides. Well, let's take a look at our outline for the book of Leviticus to see exactly where we are in our uh, study. Uh, we're using uh, the outline that has two main parts. The first part, attaining holiness, Leviticus chapter one to 16. And then the second part, practicing holiness, Leviticus uh, chapter 17 to 27. Um, so far we've gone through uh, uh, attaining holiness through uh, the offerings. And we've spent a lot of time on chapters one to seven because that's really uh, you know, the, uh, the heart of this book is uh, the uh, sacrificial system and how it was done, how it was completed, the rules and regulations. As you can see, we've uh, finished the first section of part one, the offerings, uh, which as I mentioned is the longest of the various sections and it's, it's key to understanding the other sections. If you don't, if you don't understand the offerings part, then the rest of it won't make a lot of sense either. So the offerings uh, demonstrate and describe the duties of both the offerer, the one offering the sacrifice, as well as the priest who will be presenting the sacrifice and offering it to God. This section also explains the reasons and the results for each offering, the type of offerings, and when parts of the offerings were held back, how it was to be divided between the one making the offering or the sacrifice uh, and the priest who was uh, presenting it to, to the Lord. Some of the sacrifices, as we've learned, uh, were divided. The priest got a certain portion of it. The person who brought the offering also got a portion of it. And you had to know, you know which sacrifice you could do that with. We now move on to examine the process of consecrating the men who would serve as uh, priests. We've talked about their work, which was mainly the offering of the sacrifices on behalf of the people. Now we're going to talk about how these men were put into their uh, positions. So uh, to better understand this section, we need to use uh, a timeline that begins uh, in the book of Exodus, which overlaps some of the events taking place in the book of Leviticus. For example, the uh, construction of the tabernacle uh, complex is completed. Well, we don't read about that in Leviticus. We read about that in the book of Exodus chapter 40. We know that uh, materials were donated by the people and instructions for the design and the furnishings for the tabernacle complex were given to Moses by God. And uh, the Lord empowered several artisans to fabricate, uh, fabricate rather, his exact plans so that everything was done according to divine instruction, right down to the finest detail. God's chosen people, had a place where they would interact with the living God. Next came instructions on how and when that could and would be done. So they built the tabernacle complex first, then they get the instructions as to what they would be doing with that tabernacle complex. How the, you know, what were they going to do there? Well, they were going to offer sacrifice. Well, what kind of sacrifice and how would these sacrifices be offered? So this was the next piece of, uh, uh, information that was given. And we learned about that uh, in Leviticus, uh, the sacrificial system, chapters one to seven. That's what we've been going over the last couple of lessons. So offering sacrifices of animals and produce was not new. Uh, people had been doing this for a long time. However, going forward, this process was going to be regulated by God for sacrifices offered 
at the tabernacle and only at the tabernacle. Sacrifices were no longer to be offered by a variety of people uh, on hills and under uh, trees in different ways to different gods. From now on, certain sacrifices for certain reasons would be offered in only one place, and that would be the tabernacle, and they would be offered to only one God, the true and living God who had saved the Israelites from Egyptian bondage, exhibiting incredible signs and wonders proving that he was the true God and he proved it by demonstrating his power. He had set aside or consecrated Moses and Aaron as leaders and spokesmen. They're the ones that spoke God's word, God's instructions to the people about the building of the tabernacle, about the covenant that God was making with the Israelites about the sacrificial system and all the other details that God wanted to uh, present to the, um, to the people. Now it was time to set aside and consecrate not only the place where the people were to come before God with their offerings, of course that would be the tabernacle, but also the men who were to serve as mediators between the people on one side who were bringing their offerings and God on the other side who would be receiving these offerings. And those uh, people would be the priests. At this time, uh, these were to be uh, Aaron, uh, Moses' brother, uh, as the high priest and his four sons as, uh, as, uh, as priests. So we talk about the priesthood in Leviticus chapter uh, eight uh, and nine. In uh, Exodus 28 and 29, God gave Moses the instructions for making the special garments. Remember we talked about those, the special garments for the priests, as well as how to prepare the anointing oil that was to be used exclusively for holy purposes, such as consecrating, meaning uh, setting aside for God's use the tabernacle, its furnishings, as well as the priestly garments and the priests themselves when the time came. So they, they, you know, he gave them the recipe for the special oil that would be used you know, when they were setting apart uh, the things and the place and the people that were going to be involved in the uh, offering of the sacrifices. In Exodus chapter 40, we read about the completion of the tabernacle and then how God descends upon it to demonstrate that they have completed it according to his will and that as promised, he is now present, dwelling among his people by being present in the tabernacle. That was the whole point. God was not only going to be their God and they were going to be his people, he was going to dwell among them and he was going to dwell among them in the tabernacle complex. We read about that, we will go back and read about that in uh, Exodus chapter uh, 40, uh, beginning in verse 34. It says, then the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Throughout all their journeys, wherever the cloud, whenever the cloud was taken up over the tabernacle, the sons of Israel would set out. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out until the day when it was taken up. For throughout all of their journeys, the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day and there was fire in it by night in the sight of all the house of Israel. So there's a, a pretty dynamic uh, sign of God's uh, presence within the tabernacle. You know, the cloud of smoke is there uh, over the tabernacle, uh, uh, you know, telling the people that not only God is present, but that they were to stay put where they were. And when the cloud lifted, then they would move according to the instructions that uh, uh, Moses received. Uh, so the cloud was over the tabernacle by day, and then there was fire in the cloud uh, to give light uh, by night. And so in this way, the people were constantly reminded of God's presence 
and constantly reminded that his presence was over the tabernacle, that that was the place that man and God would meet through the intermediary work of the priests. And so that brings us to the priests. What is left to do is to prepare the priests themselves for their constant interaction in close proximity to God by consecrating them. In other words, by setting them apart for this special service. And to do this, they had a special ceremony given to Moses to carry out for this uh, unique purpose. And so we have uh, in um, Leviticus chapters eight and nine, the consecration ceremony of the priests, and it was a long and involved one. We're going to talk about that today. So we begin in Leviticus chapter eight. We read the first a couple of verses. It says, then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, take Aaron and his sons with him and the garments and the anointing oil and the bull of the sin offering and the two rams and the basket of unleavened bread and assemble all the congregation at the doorway of the tent of meeting. So Moses did just as the Lord commanded him. When the congregation was assembled at the doorway of the tent of meeting, Moses said to the congregation, this is the thing which the Lord has commanded to do. So I want you to note that the tabernacle complex, the priestly garments, the priests and the anointing oil, as well as the animals for sacrifice and the basket of bread have all been mentioned and prepared in advance for the coming of this day. And we've learned about that from various passages in the book of uh, Exodus. Exodus uh, 28 talks about the garments and the oil. Exodus 30 talks about the animals uh, and, the, uh, and the bread. Now note that the uh, Pentateuch is, uh, is actually one book with five volumes. It's not five separate books, okay? All five books are, are interconnected. So it's really one work divided into five parts. So as God's chosen representative, um, uh, Moses serves in God's role in the proceeding. So Moses represents God in all of this. It will be God himself acting through Moses who will be the one who is actually consecrating the tabernacle, the priests, their garments uh, into the service of the, uh, of the Lord. Note also that after Moses will have offered the sacrifices and consecrated the people and the objects uh, with the holy oil, he himself will no longer be allowed to offer sacrifice or enter into the holy place or the Holy of Holies. I mean, he's been the one that has built all of this. You know, he's directed the building out of all these things. And God has used him as the individual who would consecrate and anoint the priests who would be working in these areas. But once that was done, he himself, he wasn't a priest. He was not consecrated as a priest. So he himself would no longer be allowed to enter into these places. Now only the priests would be allowed to do this. So despite his leadership of the people and his direct relationship with God, after the consecration, only the priests would be able to offer sacrifice or enter the holy place, and only the high priest would be allowed to enter the holy of holies, and then only once per year on the day of atonement. Note also that Moses is instructed to gather the people. Well, you know, there were a lot of people, a couple of million people, so uh, probably what he gathered or who he gathered were the leaders of the tribes. Still a good number of, of people, but it was the leaders that were there to witness what was taking place, uh, who would then go back to their uh, tribes and families and report about what took place at the tabernacle. And so the leaders were there to witness the consecration since the people as well as the priests would participate in the offering of sacrifices to God. After all, the tabernacle belonged to the people as well. I mean, uh, the priests would be there and they would be the ones, the only ones allowed to, you know, to go in and out and to serve and to touch things 
Uh, but the tabernacle also belonged to the people. It was the place they would go in order to interact with God. So we begin with the clothing that Aaron uh, would wear, the, the priestly garments. And um, in uh, chapter uh, eight, verses six to nine, uh, Moses' first action is to wash the priests, probably in the water of the laver that is situated in the courtyard. Uh, this symbolized a, a cleansing from sin and purification. So you have Aaron who would serve as the high priest and his four sons, Nadab, Abihu, uh, Eleazar, and Ithamar. Those four, four would serve as priests and uh, Aaron would serve as high priest. Uh, learn about that in Exodus 28. This act of washing as well as the sacrifices to follow emphasize the fact that the priests chosen by God to preside at the ceremonies designed to deal with the people's sins had to first have their own sins acknowledged and removed. They had to be purified before they would be acting on behalf of the people and their own uh, purification. As the high priest, Aaron had a more elaborate attire than his sons. Uh, who wore simply a linen garment tied with a sash, uh, and they wore this linen garment over uh, a set of underwear. Uh, today we'd call them shorts, along with a head covering like a cap. Aaron's clothing, on, on the other hand, was more elaborate, and the clothing was placed upon him uh, by, um, uh, by uh, Moses. And so, uh, as the high priest, uh, he would wear the following. He would have a tunic, uh, which was a linen undergarment. Uh, it was worn by all the, the priests. Uh, we learned about that in Exodus 28, as well as Exodus 39. Next would be a sash, a length of cloth that was made of fine twisted linen, uh, used as a belt. Uh, again, Exodus 28 and 39. Then he wore a robe. This was worn by the high priest over his tunic as a sign of his office. Uh, it was blue in color. Uh, it, it was sleeveless. It was made of beautiful material woven from a single piece of cloth without, uh, without a seam. Uh, Exodus 28 again and uh, 39. Now uh, on the robe, there were a series of small golden bells and pomegranates. You know, there was a bell and a pomegranate, a bell and a pomegranate that were sewn to the hem of the robe. I don't know if you can see that in the, uh, in the uh, graphic there on the, uh, on the slide. Uh, the bells uh, signified the presence of the high priest in the tabernacle before God and the pomegranates were a symbol of righteousness, also a symbol of knowledge, since it was uh, believed uh, uh, that the pomegranates contained 613 seeds, uh, which was the same number as the number of laws contained in the Torah. The next piece of uh, clothing was the uh, ephod. The ephod was like, a, was like an apron made of blue, purple and scarlet material. It had designs of golden thread woven into the, uh, into the fabric. It was attached to the shoulders with golden chains and the patches on each one of the shoulders um, had a, a precious stone to which the um, chains were connected and each, as I said, had a, an onyx stone with the names, six on each stone, the names of the uh, 12 tribes of uh, Israel, and they were, um, uh, they were placed there in uh, alphabetical order. And uh, the symbolism of having the names of the tribes was that uh, the high priest uh, carried the burden of the people uh, on his, uh, on his uh, shoulders. The next piece was the uh, breastplate that you see in the middle. The uh, breastplate was a square pouch and it was uh, folded in such a way, uh, kind of folded in on itself 
so something could be carried inside the pocket. Uh, it was made of the same material as the ephod and it was adorned with 12 precious stones, each with the name of one of the tribes of Israel. Symbolically, these testified to the fact that when the high priest entered the holy or most holy place, that he took the entire nation with him. He represented all the people. Then there was the uh, Urim and Thummim. These were two, they're not pictured here, uh, they were inside the pocket, okay? Inside the pocket of the breast piece. So these two stones uh, could be cast like dice uh, in order to produce a yes, a no, or a neutral answer uh, to a question. It was believed that if used properly by the high priest, that the answer came from God. We read about that in Exodus 28 verse 30. These stones were kept, as I say, in the pocket of the uh, breast piece. And then of course the turban, uh, a, a cloth made of fine linen and wrapped about the head of the high priest. Only the high priest wore a turban. The other priests wore a cap, not the same thing. Also a golden plate or what was called a crown, but it was actually a, a plate was uh, attached to the turban and it was inscribed with the words, holy to the Lord, holy to the Lord. We read about that in Exodus 28, 36 to 38, as well as Exodus 39 verses 30 and 31. And so this uniform uh, with this beautiful, fantastic uh, you know, clothing uh, was quite impressive. It was designed to make men marvel. It was made for glory and beauty. The, uh, the high priest's garments reflected the significance of the work that he did and the greatness of the God that he, that he served. The next uh, thing we learn about is the anointing of the tabernacle and the priests, Leviticus 8 chapters 10 to 13. Let's read about that. It says, uh, Moses then took the anointing oil and anointed the tabernacle and all that was in it and consecrated them. He sprinkled some of it on the altar seven times and anointed the altar and all of its utensils and the basin and its stand to consecrate them. Then he poured some of the anointing oil on Aaron's head and anointed him to consecrate him. Next, Moses, has, Moses had Aaron's sons come near and clothed them with tunics and girded them with sashes and bound caps on them, just as the Lord had commanded Moses. So we see that Moses you know, uh, uses the special oil to sprinkle or to anoint or to set apart the tabernacle itself and all of its furnishings and utensils. He anoints the altar of burnt offerings in the courtyard seven times. And we know in Jewish numerology, the number seven represented perfection or completeness. It was a combination of two numbers, the number three, which represented God, and the number four, which represented God's creation, uh, north, south, east, west, four. All right. And so when you brought the four and the three together, God and his creation, you had perfection, you had completeness. And so the altar uh, therefore uh, is sprinkled seven times, therefore it is completely and perfectly consecrated for its intended purpose, which will be to offer sacrifices to God by fire. Then uh, Moses anoints Aaron as high priest, and then he dresses uh, Aaron's sons as priests uh, and they wear more simple uh, garb, uh, but he anoints them as well. In Exodus uh, 28 verse uh, 41, Moses was commanded to do the following in order to prepare Aaron and his sons for the priesthood. First, he had to anoint them. And the anointing was there to set them apart for God's purpose. Secondly, he ordained them. 
This means he appointed them to a special task or to a special role. In this case, it was to be as priests uh, on behalf of the people to uh, God. And then thirdly, he was to consecrate them. This means to be assigned to a holy position used by God for his purpose. So Aaron and his sons have been anointed in that they have been set apart from the rest of the Israelites to serve God in a special way. They have also been ordained to serve as priests on behalf of the people before God. And they have received the special clothing as a sign of this role with Aaron wearing the elaborate clothing signifying his uh, special role as the high priest. We then uh, go forward, or in, the, in Leviticus, it goes forward and explains the consecration ceremony itself in chapter eight, verses 14, all the way to chapter nine, verses 24. And so begins the longest part of the preparations for the priests to begin their ministry. The sacrifices that Moses and then the priests themselves will offer in order to make their transition from individuals who are part of the Israeli nation to anointed, ordained and consecrated priests of the Most High God. That transformation takes several days. For, their, uh, for time purposes, I'm going to list in order the stages that Moses performs and commands to be done in order, you know, in the order that they appear, okay? We don't have time to read everything, but we'll look at all the stages in order to take, you know, Aaron and his sons from being part of the Israeli nation to becoming priests of the Most High God. So the first thing is the sin offering. A bull is offered. We've gone over this type of sacrifice, you know, one of the five sacrifices. This time it's Aaron and his sons who place their hands on the animal, signifying that they have placed their sins uh, onto the bull. Moses dabs the bull's blood on the horns of the altar. He pours the rest of the blood at the base of the altar thus cleansed both the altar and the priests of uncleanness and sin, rendering both the altar and the priests ready now to offer sacrifice on behalf of the people and their sins. Moses completes the sin offering by burning the fat parts on the altar and the rest at a clean place outside the camp. As in all sin offerings, no part of the bull was kept for food it was completely burnt up. So that was the first step, the sin offering. Second step was the uh, burnt offering, and that would be the first ram was offered. We read about that in Leviticus 8, 18 to uh, 21. Burnt offerings were uh, made to signify the dedication that the offerer had toward God. In this case, it signified the dedication Aaron and his sons had towards the ministry which uh, they had been given. The uh, third step was the ordination offering. That was the second ram. This offering was not among the five regular offerings that would normally be offered by the priests. It was part of their ordination process. And so Moses served as priest and presented the ram Aaron and his sons again placed their hands on the animal. Then Moses uh, slaughtered the animal. He then placed some of the animal's blood on Aaron's right earlobe, his thumb, and on his big toe of his right foot. And then he repeated the procedure for Aaron's sons. The symbolism was that the priest's entire body from head to foot was consecrated to the Lord's service and the priest accepted his ordination into ministry. The ear, the thumb, and the toe. He was to use his ears to hear and understand God's commands. His hands, you know, the reason of anointing the thumb, his hands were there to do God's work. 
and uh, anointing the big toe and the right foot represented his feet. His feet were to go where God directed him to go. Aaron and his sons took part of the animal and the grain elements, and then they made a wave offering. Okay, we know what that is. Lifting them up in the air to symbolize that they, and not Moses or the people, they were the ones making the offering. After this, Moses took these things from them and he burnt them on the altar. Moses then took the remaining breast of the animal and made a wave offering of it, symbolically offering it to God, but he kept this part for himself, which was custom for priests to do in offerings which were not burnt or sin offerings for themselves. In other words, they were a peace offering that they shared. Number four, I told you it was, it's quite, you know, it was quite a, uh, a complex uh, and lengthy uh, ceremony. So the fourth, fourth part here uh, is the anointing of Aaron and his son. So let's just read a part of that in Leviticus 8 verse uh, 30. It says, so Moses took some of the anointing oil and some of the blood which was on the altar and sprinkled it on Aaron, on his garments, on his sons, and on the garments of his sons with him. And he consecrated Aaron, his garments, and his sons, and the garments of his sons uh, with him. So this was the second time that Moses anointed. The first time uh, was at the very beginning, before the consecration ceremony began. The difference this time was that the first time it was only the oil that was used to sprinkle. This time the oil was mixed with the blood of the sacrifice. The first time the oil was poured on Aaron's head. The second time the oil was sprinkled on Aaron and his garments. The first time only Aaron was anointed. The second time the anointing includes Aaron's sons and their garments as well. And so the main difference between the two anointings was that the first was to prepare Aaron to make his offerings, to cleanse him, to come before God with his sons. The second anointing was to confirm that the rituals had been accomplished, their purpose was done, and the anointed ones were now considered to be priests in service to God. Now you'd think, you know, that's a pretty elaborate ceremony. Uh, you know, we, we could stop right here and they could begin their, their, their ministry, but no, there was still more to come. Fifth step, there was a seven day waiting period. We read about that in Leviticus 8, 31 to 36. After the consecration and ordination rituals were performed, and these were done before the leaders of the people gathered at the entrance of the tabernacle complex, the newly ordained priests kept a seven day vigil remaining in the tabernacle complex day and night. And this was under pain of death. Each day Moses would offer the sacrifice of ordination and Aaron and his sons would eat of it along with the grain offering, the, uh, the unleavened bread, burning up whatever was not eaten. And this process was repeated for seven days. Again, why seven days? First of all, to fully atone for their sins and demonstrate the absolute purity and holiness of the priests. I mean, their ordination was repeated seven times. Again, seven representing perfection. Also, it was a witness to the people uh, of the holiness of their priests. They saw what the priests went through in order to qualify for the work that they would do on behalf of the people. And then it was also a time for the priests to reflect on their unique and demanding role in God's service. The sixth step. The sixth step were the activities that took place on the eighth day. They've had the vigil for seven days on the eighth day, Leviticus 9 verses 1 to 21. So as the seven days were winding down, Moses gives instructions for what will happen when the vigil is over and the priests will begin their official duties. 
He instructs Aaron and sons, as well as the people, to each prepare the animals and grain for sacrifices that the priests were to offer for the first time by themselves without Moses' uh, assistance. One sacrifice was to be for the priests themselves and the other for the people, after which the Lord would bless them. And so we begin with the offering for the priests, Leviticus 9 verses 8 to 14. So this first offering is a sin offering for Aaron and his sons, thus atoning for their sins and providing forgiveness. A second animal was offered as a burnt offering, signifying their complete devotion to the Lord, since the animal was completely reduced to ashes. Then there was an offering for the people, Leviticus 9, 15 to 21. Now that the priests had been fully ordained and have first offered sacrifices for their own sins and to demonstrate complete devotion to God, they are now ready to minister on behalf of God's people. Aaron and his sons make several kinds of offerings on behalf of the people. First, they make a sin offering in order to atone and receive forgiveness for the people. Next, they make a burnt offering uh, to demonstrate complete devotion to God. Then there is a grain offering, reinforcing the purpose and conviction of the worshiper. He went over and above what was required. And then there was a peace offering, a celebration, uh, a sacrifice that sought peace with the Lord and a joyful fellowship with other, uh, with other people. So at this point, the priests have been officially ordained. They've begun their duties in the recently constructed and consecrated tabernacle where they themselves have just completed offering various sacrifices for themselves and for the people. The last of which calls on joyful fellowship with their brethren and even God himself. Everything done according to God's will and specific instructions. The last step, blessings from the Lord in Leviticus chapter nine, verses 22 to 24. Let's read that, shall we? Then Aaron lifted up his hands towards the people and blessed them. And he stepped down after making the sin offering and the burnt offering and the peace offerings. Moses and Aaron went into the tent of meeting. When they came out and blessed the people, the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. Then fire came out from before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the portions of fat on the altar. And when all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces. And so God confirms Moses' leadership and Aaron's new role by an appearance of his glory, not his person. Fire appears to burn up the sacrifice on the altar. The people recognize God's presence with a shout, a shout of joy, a shout of awe, and they fall on their faces in reverence and worship. God's appearance gives authority, credibility, and assurance that the sacrificial system and the priests who administer it um, effectively achieve its purpose. In other words, he guarantees that what has just happened uh, will uh, um, uh, enable the priests to do their job. And what, what is their job going to be? Well, to offer sacrifice on behalf of the people. For what reason? In order to atone for their sins, in order to give thanks, in order, in order to express their love for God. His appearance at this point demonstrates that uh, the system is gonna work the way it's supposed to work and the people who will administer the system, the priests, you know, they have God's blessings. So the people are, in, are encouraged. So um, uh, as I said, God's appearance gives authority, credibility, and assurance that the system, the priests who administer it, will achieve its purpose. And the purposes are to atone and forgive sin, to offer thanks in an acceptable manner, to accept the devotion offered by the worshipers, and to create a joyful fellowship between man and God. 
And so Moses and Aaron have jointly blessed the people as a sign of their solidarity and God has provided a miraculous sign as approval of these men and uh, their roles before the people, thus providing a high point in the history of the Jewish nation. This perfection, as we will find out, will not last very long as we uh, will begin studying chapter 10. However, this is a high point. If, if you ever had a test and somebody asks you, uh, you know, name some of the high points in the Bible, name some of the you know, moments of real uh, victory, of real joy, uh, you know, a, a, spiritual, a spiritual high point. Well, you could go to Leviticus chapter nine and say, here's, here's a high point. Uh, when all things, you know, the tabernacle, the priests, uh, the system, Moses, Aaron, you know, uh, all come together according to God's will and have done everything according to God's will and God confirms it with a, 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 an appear, not appearance of his person, but an appearance of his glory by burning up the sacrifice that's on the altar in front of the people and the priests. That, that, is, that is a high point in the history of the Jewish uh, nation. Okay, well, for uh, our next lesson, I want you to read ahead chapters 10 and 11. And as you read 10 and 11, you'll see that they reached a high point, but they didn't stay there for very long. Well, we'll study that next time we are uh, together. Thank you again for your attention. Uh, sometimes uh, getting through Leviticus is a, is a bit difficult. There's, a, there's lots of information uh, to, uh, to go through. Uh, I hope it's been clear. I hope that you're able to retain this as we continue our uh, study through this uh, amazing and fascinating book. Thank you for your attention. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.